Jam Vishnu Pad Padmosa Parajik Jari Asu Tadasati Sashish Mahar. His Divine Grace Sesi Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jam Vishnu Pad Padmosa Parajik Jari Asu Tadasati Sashish Mahar. Shringa Guru Shila Bhakti Sadanta Sarasati Kosama Maharaj Ki Jai. Ananti Kodi Vaishnav Indi Ki Jai. His Khan BBT Founder Acharya Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Nama Acharya Srila Haridas Thakur Ki Jai. Premsa Koho Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda. Shri Advaita Gadadha Shivasadi Gaur Bhaktivinda Kijai. Shri Shri Radha Krishna Gopi Gopinath Shamakund Radha Kund Giri Govardhan Kijai. Vrindavan Dham Kijai. Maipur Dham Kijai. Navadip Dham Kijai. Jagannath Puri Dham Kijai. New Dwarka Dham Kijai. Their Divine Lordship Shri Shri Rukmini Dwarkadish Kijai. Their Divine Lordship Shri Shri Jagannath Baladev Shimate Subhadra Kijai. Their Divine Lordship Shri Shri Gornitai Kijai. Grantara Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Transcendental Book Distribution ki jai. Hare Nam Sankirtan Jaga ki jai. Transcendental Prashadam Distribution ki jai. Gaur Pramananda Hare Hare Bo. All glories to all the Sama devotees, Hare Krishna. All glories to all the Sama devotees, Hare Krishna. All glories to all the Sama devotees, Hare Krishna. All glories, all glories to Sri Sri Guru and Sri Gauranga. Glories to Sri the Prabhupada. Namaskar. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya All glories to Sri Balaram's appearance day. In honor of Lord Balaram, I picked out two verses. And uh, we could chant them together if you want to follow along. But just to save time, we're not going to chant, take turns chanting. So this is uh, verses from the 10th canto, chapter 65, verses 28 and 29. These are Jumuna Devi's prayers to Lord Balaram. So it's kind of a simple verse. So we could do it together. Rama Rama Mahabaho Najane Tavarikamam Yasha Kamsena Virita Jagati Jagatapate. So she's praying out to Rama. Lord Ram, Ram. This is, uh, you, you know, we'll talk about the pastime a little bit, but this is after he had his plow out and she was afraid. So she says, I, don't under, I didn't understand who you were. You know, you were the master of the universe practically. So this is what she says. Rama, Rama, O mighty armed one, I know nothing of your prowess. With a single portion of yourself, you hold up the earth, O Lord of the universe. So this portion refers to the expansion Sesha. Sesha Naga. So uh, she's understanding now the whole universe that there are many, many planets, and within those planets, Earth is just one planet. There's many rivers on that planet, and among them, I am only one river, and I'm sustained by you. So just think of your position and think of my position. How can I even understand your glory? I just simply know that you're immensely powerful. So in this first prayer, she's acknowledging uh, Lord Balaram's glories and it glorifies him wholeheartedly. And she's admitting her ignorance. So she's praying, please don't afflict me. You give pleasure to the world, so don't afflict me. You're immensely powerful. Just one part of you, you know, upholds the entire universe. You're Jagat Pate. You're the master of the universe. And I'm just a small part, tiny part in this universe. 
So she's saying that. So she's asking for protection. And this is what the next verse, she's going to ask for protection. Param bhavam bhagavato Bhagavan mama janatim Mokta marhasi vishvatman Prapanam bhakta vatsala So she's saying, my Lord, please release me, O soul of the universe. I didn't understand your position as a supreme Godhead, but now I have surrendered unto you, and you are always kind to your devotees. <clears throat> so she's appealing to his supreme nature, his supremacy, his transcendental position. She's admitting that I didn't know about you, but now I come to know it. So you're the soul of the universe, you're inside of everything, and yet, you know, I want that mercy. Please liberate me. And why did I disobey you? Because he asked her to come. And because of that, I deserve to be punished. But why should I be liberated? Because I'm surrendering to you. And if somebody surrenders to you, then because... You're the Lord and you're the lover of your devotees. You're the caretaker of your devotees. So this is how she's praying to Krishna. Oh, my dear Lord, I didn't know your glory and that's why I did wrong. But now I've come to know your glory and I've surrendered to you. And so because you're the protector of the surrendered, please protect me and release me. So the point is that sometimes we get into illusion and that's unfortunate. And of course, it's preventable. But sometimes, just out of the force of circumstances, lack of caution or whatever, we get into illusion. But what's important is that it's not that we never get into illusion, but we can try our best never to get into it. But that's our first mistake. We get into illusion. But now, how we respond to that mistake is what Jamuna Devi is teaching us. Do we correct the mistake or do we perpetuate the mistake? So, perpetuating a mistake means that we try to justify what we did and we try to prove that what I did was right. But no, we should admit that we're wrong and then correct it. So, whenever we go into illusion, you know, there's that delusion, it's dangerous. And Krishna will teach us by punishing us that we shouldn't fall into this danger. But we can pray to Krishna. Now I understand how powerful you are. I understand how powerful your illusory energy is. But if we don't understand Krishna's protection, then we'll fall under misery. So this is Jamuna Devi. She's given us a very nice example. <clears throat> Please release me like she's praying. You're the source of bala, strength. Protect me when temptation comes. And that way we could resist temptation and stay fixed in devotion. So this is the, just kind of the idea of these two verses. So Lord Balaram's appearance, he is actually the original servitor. He was a seven child. Of course, we know a divine incarnation. He's the first, very first expansion of Lord Krishna, St. Krishan. And he appeared in the, mood, in the womb of Devaki. And it's described he was very brilliant, effulgent, and she was very joyful. And uh, she could understand that some kind of divine entity has entered into my womb. And at that time, that's when Lord Krishna called upon his Yogamaya potency, and he instructed her that, I want you to transfer this beautiful child who is none other than Balaram, my original expansion, the first of all incarnations of Godhead, into the room, womb of Rohini from the womb of Devaki. So we see actually Vasudeva had several wives, and two of them, which were Devaki and Rohini, and that was the time when Kamsa was persecuting Vasudeva and Devaki. Vasudeva and 
David Kim, put them into prison. <clears throat> and Vasudev entrusted his other wife, Rohini, to live in a coward village of his dear most friend, Nanda Maharaj. So she was living in Gokul along with Nanda and Yasoda and under the protection of the Vrajabhasis. And she was living a very happy life. <clears throat> so the child was then transferred into her womb and it was like the full moon night of the month of Shravan. And this beautiful child, Balaram, was born. So this is, Balaram's presence is so important. It's described in the Brahma Samhita and in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. And the Brahma Samhita says, Krishna's two Bhagavan Swayam. That Krishna is the original form of the absolute truth. Govinda Maripusham Tamaham Bajami. He is the Adi Purusha, the original person. Now, when Krishna is in the spiritual world of Goloka Vrindavan and he wants to enjoy transcendental Leela, he first expands himself as Vaibhava Prakash, and that's Baladev. And he is the original servitor of Godhead. He's actually Krishna, and he appears to serve Krishna. And how does he appear to serve Krishna? So, we'll talk about that different pastimes. So here's the verse we chanted, Rama, Rama, Maha, Baho. We see Balaram was very much angry because he wanted to sport in the waters with his girlfriends, the gopis. But Jamuna thought she was, he was drunk and why should I approach him and all this, so many excuses she had. <clears throat> so Balaram's plow is very important. And why does Balaram carry a plow? What do we do with the plow? We clear the road, right? We prepare the field so that the seeds will grow. We use that purpose, the plow for the purpose of agriculture, or even to make roads to clear obstacles. So Balaram is the original spiritual master. So he's personified with his plow for the, doing this purpose. So first of all, the guru plows our hearts. His words are like plow that make our hearts nice and soft and so that the seed of devotion can grow and we'd be attracted to the sweet sound of Krishna's flute. So we must understand that when the, the dirt of the ground is very dry, it has to be plowed. And that plowing, it may not be a very pleasurable thing for the earth because the ground's being ripped apart. It's just being ripped and ripped and ripped apart like that. So that's the purpose of the guru. To rip our hearts apart until it becomes very soft. To just plow it and <laughs> plow it until the hardness, the false ego, the pride, the illusion, the lust, anger and greed. These have to be taken out and that way the heart becomes soft and the seed of love of Krishna can grow. So that Balaram's plow comes like in his rep as his representative, the spiritual master. He softens our heart for the seed of love so that we can become attracted to Krishna's flute. So the spiritual master is considered the representative of Balaram. And Balaram has so many wonderful incarnations. He's the principal incarnation, but Balaram's president, Narayan, his he appears as Sankrashan, Seshanaga. He comes as Lord Krishna's bed. And Lakshmi is massaging his feet. And Balaram is his bed, his resting place. So in the, at our festival, we have a cultural presentation of bringing this mood of spiritual knowledge and spiritual activities. And this is a really nice solo dance, which was done by Krishna Kirtan and uh, uh, Gandharpa's daughter, Radhika. <clears throat> and uh, she did a very nice solo dance on Jamuna, Jamuna Devi. And this is the mood. We have to have this mood of surrendered to, to Balaram, to the spiritual master, like that, so that we can clean our hearts. So in a similar story with Balaram and his plow, we see here, and there's similar prayers that are offered. 
So we know Samba, he's the darling son of Jambavati. And he kidnapped Duryodhana's daughter, Lakshmana, from her Swayamvara assembly. And in response, the Kuravas, they joined forces to arrest him. But actually, Samba held them off single-handedly for quite a while. But the six warriors of the Kaurava party, they cheated and they deprived him of his chariot, they broke his bow to pieces, and then they seized him, and they brought him and uh, Lakshmana back to Hastinapur. So when King Ugrasena found out about this, he called upon the Yadavas to retaliate, and they were angered, and they all prepared to fight. But then Lord Balaram, he actually cooled them down, and he said, uh, you know, he, this is the verse from the 10th canto, actually. He says here, Lord Balaram, however, cooled the tempers of the Vrishni heroes who had already put on their armor. He who purifies the age of quarrel did not want a quarrel between the Krus and the Vrishnis. So this Balaram, he purifies the age of quarrel. <clears throat> Thus accompanied by the Brahmanas and family elders, he went to Hastinapur on his chariot which was as effulgent as the sun. As he went, he appeared like the moon, surrounded by the ruling planets. To see everywhere, Balaam is so beautiful. So what happened, the party of the Yadavas, they set up camp in a garden outside the city, and Lord Balaram sent Uddhava to ascertain King Dhritarashtra's face of my, frame of mind. <clears throat> And then when Uddhava appeared in the court and they said, Balaram is here. And so the Korvas were very happy. They worshipped Uddhava. And then they went to see the Lord and they brought all kinds of auspicious things to see Lord Balaram. And then uh, there's a nice verse of that. And then Srila Prabhupada writes in the Krishna, Krishna book, he says, They all exchanged words of reception by asking one another of their welfare. When such form formality was finished, Lord Balaram, in a great voice and very patiently submitted before them the following words for their consideration. So he, he said some very powerful words. And then upon hearing these words of Lord Baladev's, which were full of potency, courage, and strength, and were appropriate to his transcendental power, the Kuravas became fur furious and spoke as follows. So they offer all kinds of respect and rituals to Lord Balaram, but then when he actually told them his demand that they release Samba, they became angry and they were like amazed. And they said, what is this? You guys, the Yadavas are trying to give orders to the Kuravas. This is like a shoe trying to climb atop one's head. It's from us alone that the Yadavas have obtained the royal thorns. And yet now they're presuming themselves our equals. No longer will we extend to them royal privileges. <laughs> so there's a quote uh, I think this is from Srila Prabhupada's purport here or from the purport in the 10th canto I'm not sure but I'm just going to read it so it says here the words Kala Gatya Duryatya Ya the insurmountable movement of time the intolerable Kurus allude to the degraded age of Kali which is about to begin here the crews indicate that the fallen age of Kali had indeed already begun since they claim that now the shoe wants to climb on the head that bears the royal crown. In other words, they thought the lowly Yadus now wanted to rise above the royal crews. So this is what happens in the age of Kali. You get low-class men thinking they're kings, you know, like Kali personified and then they're saying here, this is a verse that says, only because we looked the other way could they enjoy the pair of yachttail fans and the conch shell, white umbrella throne and royal bed. So in the purport there, actually this is from Krishna book, <clears throat> Prabhupada says, <clears throat> the Yadavas should have not used such royal paraphernalia in our presence. That's what he's, he's saying. That's what, this is what the crews were thinking. But we did not check them due to their, our family relationships. So by using the word asmad upekshaya, 
the crews mean to say, they were able to use these royal insignia because we did not take the matter seriously. <laughs> and then another uh, comment by Vishnava Chakravarti Thakur, he was saying that the crews thought this, showing concern about their use of these items would have been a sign of respect. But in fact, we do not have such respect for them since they are of inferior families. They are not to be respected and so we pay no regard to them. <laughs> so this is all how they think, the demoniac, how they think like that. <clears throat> so this is what Balaram says. The dust of Krishna's lotus feet, which is the source of holiness for all places of pilgrimage, is worshipped by all the great demigods. The principal deities of all planets are engaged in his service, and they consider themselves most fortunate to take the dust of the lotus feet of Krishna on their crowns. Great demigods like Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva and even the goddess of fortune and I are simply parts of his spiritual identity and we also carefully carry that dust on our heads. And still, Krishna is not fit to use the royal insignia or even sit on the royal throne. So he's chastising them. <clears throat> so, so what happened is... Uh, Lord Balaram became very angry and he started to dig up Hastinapur with the tip of his plow and he began to drag it intending to cast the entire city into the Ganges. And then Balaram, I mean, uh, Srila Prabhupada says in the Krishna book, Lord Balaram seemed so furious that he looked as if he could burn the whole cosmic creation to ashes. He stood up steadily and taking his plow in his hand began striking the earth with it in this way, the whole city of Astinapur was separated from the earth. Lord Balaram began to drag the city towards the flowing water of the river Ganges. Because of this, there was a great tremor, tremor throughout Hastinapur, as if there had been an earthquake, and it seemed that the whole city would be dismanished, dismantled. So they're quoting Vishnava Chakravati Thakur in the 10th canto. And he stated that the Lord's desire, his plow, by the Lord's desire, his plow actually increased in size. And that as Balaram began dragging Hastinapur towards the water, he ordered the Ganges, except for Samba, you should attack and kill everyone in the city with your water. <laughs> and thus he would fulfill his promise to rid the earth of the Korvas while making sure that nothing bad would happen to Samba. So that's in the 10th canto, that chapter 68. So the Korvas, they're seeing their city was in imminent danger. It was falling into the river and they were terrified. And so they, what they did is they quickly brought Samba and Lakshmana before Lord Balaram and they began to glorify him. And they prayed, please forgive us, forgive us. We're ignorant. Very similar prayer to Jamuna Devi. <clears throat> So this is what was happening. That city was like tumbling like a raft into the sea and it was about to be dragged away. So to save their lives, they approached Balaram. And so here's the prayer. Almost similar. Rama Rama Kiladara Prabhavamna Vadamate Muranamna Kuburhinam Ksantum Arasi Atkrip Kamam The Korva said, O oh, Rama, Rama, foundation of everything. We know nothing of your power. Please excuse our offense, for we are ignorant and misguided. So just, these are wonderful prayers. Very, there's not too many prayers just directly to Balaram, but these couple, there's a few places like this. That's 1068.44. And then I'll go to the next verse. This is continuing the prayer. You alone cause the creation, maintenance, and annihilation of the cosmos. And you, and of you, there is no prior cause. Indeed, O Lord, authorities say that the worlds are mere playthings for you, and you perform your pastimes. And they continue. O unlimited one of a thousand heads, as your pastime, you carry this earth globe upon one of your heads. At the time of annihilation, you withdraw the entire universe within your body, and remaining all alone, lie down to rest. <laughs> so just see, 
their beginning by his plow, their hearts are a little purified, <laughs> beginning to realize who he is. Your anger is meant for instructing everyone. It is not a manifestation of your hatred or envy. O Supreme Lord, you sustain the pure mode of goodness and you become angry only to maintain and protect this world. So just see, they're admitting that his anger is appropriate for their benefit. And uh, they quote a Srila Vishnava Chakravati Thakur, how he puts it. The crew is meant to say this. Because you exhibited this anger, we have now become civilized. <laughs> Whereas previously we were wicked and could not see you, blinded as we were by pride. So just see, perf this is the example. The plow, you know, comes to pave the way for Krishna, purify the heart from all these bad qualities. So the prayers continue. We bow to you, O soul of all beings, O wielder of all potencies, O tireless maker of the universe, offering you obeisances, we take shelter of you. <laughs> so they realized that their lives and destinies were in the hands of Lord Balaram. And then the next verse. So this is what Sukadev Goswami said. Thus, propitiated by the crews, whose city was trembling and who were surrendering to him in great distress. Lord Balaram became very calm and kindly disposed towards them. Do not be afraid, he said, and took away their fear. So this is what happened. And Duryodhan came. He brought his affectionate daughter and he gave her in dowry 1,260-year-old elephants. So I guess they're auspicious to be old. He gave her 120,000 horses, 6,000 golden chariots. They shined like the sun and a thousand maidservants, jewel lockets on their neck. So amazing. So this is a, another verse, the next verse actually. The Supreme Lord Chief of the Yadavas accepted all these gifts and then departed with his son and daughter-in-law as his well-wishers bid him farewell. <laughs> Then Lord Halayuda entered the city of Dorka and met his relatives, whose hearts were all bound in him in loving attachment. In the assembly hall, he reported to the Yadu leaders everything about his dealings with the crews. So even today, you could go to the city of Hastinapur, is visibly elevated on the southern side along the Ganges. And that's showing the signs of Lord Balaram's prowess. Has anybody ever seen that? Can you remember that in Hastinapur? And uh, Prabhupada's purport to this verse in the Krishna book, he says, the Kuravas became superficially insulted by this order, so they challenged Lord Balaram's power. They simply wanted to see him exhibit his inconceivable strength. Thus, with great pleasure, they handed over their daughter to Samba. The whole matter was settled. <laughs> So then Balaram assured them that he wouldn't harm them. And that's when Duridon came with all these beautiful gifts for Samba and Lakshmana. So, Krishna and Balaram. Actually, in the Adilila, there's a verse that says, Ekai sarupa donhe bina matrakaya adyakaya vyuha krishna lilara sahaya. These two who are one in the same identity. They differ only in form. Lord Balaram is the first bodily expansion of Krishna, and he assists the Lord Krishna's transcendental pastimes. So Lord Balaram is considered to be a svamsa expansion. So there's no difference in potency between Krishna and Balaram. The only difference is in their bodily structure. So this is the first expansion. Balaram is the chief deity of Mink deity amongst the quadruple forms and he is the foremost assistant in Krishna's transcendental activities. So Krishna Das Kaivarajas and Prabhupada actually explain as we mentioned that there's no difference between Krishna and Balaram in potency and the only difference is in construction. And once in Alabad, uh, Gira Swami recalls it was at the Kumbh Mela and there was a dispute that took place between some two devotees. 
on this point. It was Madhuvisa Prabhu. And uh, he said, there's no difference between Krishna and Balaram. The only difference is that Krishna is blackish and Balaram is whitish. But Jamuna Devi disagreed with him. And he, she said, there is another difference because Krishna is the only enjoyer of Srimati Radharani. So the two are arguing. And then so His Holiness Tamal Krishna Goswami, who was Prabhupada's zonal secretary at that time, he brought the matter to Prabhupada. And he began to tell Prabhupada, you know, Prabhupada, Madhuvi says that the only difference between Krishna and Balaram is the color. And, uh, you know, Krishna is blackish and Balaram is white. And Prabhupada replied, he's right. And then Tamal Krishna Goswami continued. But he said, but, but Mother Jamuna Devi is saying that there's another difference because Krishna is the only enjoyer of Srimati Radharani. And Prabhupada responded, she's right. And then Tamal Krishna Goswami offered, well, Srila Prabhupada, they're saying different things. They both cannot be right. And Srila Prabhupada replied, you are right. And then Tamal Krishna Goswami asked, well, then which is right? And then Prabhupada answered, you decide. So there's another incident along the same lines. Srila Prabhupada asked, who's stronger, Krishna or Balaram? Although they both have equal potencies as Swamsa, there's still some differences. So Srila Prabhupada asked, who's stronger? So a devotee, you couldn't hear what he said. It's on the tape. It, it's inaudible. And then Gira Swami says, she says that Krishna is stronger because Balaram receives his strength from Krishna. Well, that is, well, well, that is true. You're right. And then Marari Chaitanya says something. It's also inaudible. So Gira Swami says again, Yes, Marari says he agrees that Krishna is stronger because Krishna is full in all opulences and one of the opulences is strength. And then another devotee speaks and then Gira Swami has to repeat. He says that Balaram is stronger because he is Krishna's elder brother. And Prabhupada answered, Krishna is stronger, but the evidence that Prabhupada gave is different from what anyone else suggested. And the evidence Prabhupada gave is not coming from the books. But Krish, Prabhupada said, Krishna is stronger because the deity of Lord Balaram rests his arm on Krishna's shoulder. <laughs> so this is Prabhupada's explanation. So we see Krishna and Balaram's strength. I mean, we could go in for hours on each of these pastimes. But just to give you a visual, one picture is worth a thousand words. <laughs> so we see here in the wrestling match, and we see here smashing Palambasura. That's the same pastime. And we see the ass demons being whirled and just like just thrown up on trees. This is the power of Krishna and Balaram. And we see here the Veda, the gorilla, being punched out by Balaram. And then uh, there's these demons, they represent all these so-called, you know, they're like swamis and so many different things. So these are represented by the demons that we see, and Krishna and Balaram kill them. Just like with his plow, he's killing demons. So at the questions and answers booth at the Rathyatra festival, Gira Swami was, somebody asked him a question, so he was explaining to him how he approached to the Prabhupada when he first met Prabhupada, that was the first time he ever met him, they came. And he said, you know, there's so many swamis and yogis and they each give a method of realization and they each say that theirs is the best. So how do I know what is the best? And Srila Prabhupada just brilliantly answered. He said, what is your goal? Do you want to become God or to serve God? So Prabhupada just saw right through him. So that was the best question actually the basic question was he's asking what is the the means and Prabhupada's saying well what is your end what's the means to the end so this is what Prabhupada's explaining so Prabhupada says if you want to become God it means you are now not God and how can not God become God Krishna is God he's always God he doesn't have to become God by yoga or meditation he is God when he is playing on the lap of Mother Soda. He's God when he's speaking the Bhagavad Gita. He's God. He's always God. 
He doesn't have to become God. And Prabhupada continues, if you sow the seed of service to God and water it by chanting and hearing, God will give you all favorable conditions to make it grow. But if you want to become God, you're only cheating yourself. Why should God help the competition? So what do you think? You want to serve God or become God? So Giraswami, he was feeling that Srila Prabhupada saw right through him. Not only through him, but he saw right through his apartment, right into his room <laughs> and on the wall where he, he actually wrote very beautiful, ornate letters, you are God. So Giraswami admitted to Prabhupada, yes, I want to serve God, but actually I wanted to become God. So Prabhupada said, yes. So that's when um, Giraswami, he said, I met my perfect master and I surrendered. And he said, I felt ashamed in front of everybody because every, everybody's going to say, look, he wanted to become God. <laughs> they would be glaring at him. So that, he paid his obeisances and he stayed down a long time so that, you know, he didn't want to get up because everybody might be glaring at him. But then he heard him distributing prasadam, so then he got up. So we know the Beatles actually asked you the Prabhupada a similar question. And Prabhupada also answered, you know, how do we know who, there's so many gurus and swamis out there, how do we know? And then Prabhupada talked about the parampara system, how, you know, we're talking about the parampara, and Balaram is the first spiritual master. And then Prabhupada also mentioned one who is most addic addicted to Krishna, then you know that he's bona fide. So this is Krishna and Balaram killing all these big demons, but just simply with a blade of grass, Balaram killed someone. So this is a pastime from the Srimad Bhagavatam. This is also in the 10th canto. And uh, so Lord Balaram actually heard that the crews were preparing for war, you know, with the Pandavas. So he wanted to be neutral, so he departed to go to holy places. So <clears throat> actually, Duridon and Yudhisthira, they were both dear to Lord Balaram. And Balaram did you know, want to get involved in that awkward situation. So he just left. So after bathing at Prabhas and honoring the demigods and sages, you know, all the forefathers and prominent human beings, he went into the company of the brahmanas on the portion of the Sarasvati that flows westward to the sea. So he, he visited many, many uh, holy places. And then he came to the Naimasaranya forest where these great sages were performing an elaborate sacrifice. So recognizing Lord Balaram's arrival, the sages who were engaged in sacrificial, sacrificial rituals, they actually stood up and greeted him properly, and they began to worship him. So after being worshipped, along with his entourage, uh, the Lord accepted a seat of honor. But then he noticed that Ramaharshana, Vyasadeva's disciple had remained seated. And Lord Balaram became very angry. And upon seeing this member of the Sutta class, he failed to stand up and bow down with his joint palms. You know, even though he was amongst learned brahmanas, you know, I'm sorry? Yeah. Yeah, so this Ramaharshana Rama Sutta, he failed to offer respect and greet Lord Balaram, which is a standard way of, repeat, you know, of treating uh, superiors. So then Balaram said, this is what he said, because this fool, born from an improperly mixed marriage, sits above all these brahmanas and even above me, the protector of religion, he deserves to die. Although he is a disciple of the divine sage Vyas, and has thoroughly learned many scriptures from him, including the law books of religious duties and the epic histories and Puranas, all this study has not produced good qualities in him. Rather, his study of the scriptures is like an actor's study of his part. Just see. For he's not self-controlled or humble and vainly presumes himself a scholarly authority, though he has failed to conquer his own mind. Wow. So, 
This very purpose of my descent into this world is to kill such hypocrites who pretend to be religious. Indeed, they are the most sinful rascals. So Balaram wasn't prepared to overlook Ramaharshana's offense, and he descended specifically to eliminate those who claim to be great religious leaders, and they, but they don't respect the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So Sukadeva Goswami continued, Although Lord Balaram had stopped killing the impious, Ramaharshana's death was inevitable. Thus having spoken, the Lord killed him by picking a blade of kusha grass and touching him with its tip. <laughs> it's amazing. So Prabhupada writes in the purport there that Balaram wanted to avoid taking part in the battle of Kukshetra. Yet his position of an incarnation was to reestablish <clears throat> religious principles. That was his prime duty. So considering this point, he killed Ramaharshana Sutta simply by striking him, just touching him with a kusha straw. You see, it's nothing but a blade of grass. That's amazing. So this is the power of Lord Balaam. He could do anything. Fight with wrestlers, kill huge demons, or just use a blade of grass. Or his plow. <laughs> so many things. So this is, so all the sages cried out, alas, alas, in great distress. They told Lord Sankarshan, O master, you have committed a, an irreligious act. O favorite of the Yadus, we gave him the seed of the spiritual master and promised him long life and freedom for physical pain for as long as this sacrifice continues. So he wasn't actually a, a Brahmana, but he was in mixed marriage, as Lord, Bal, uh, Lord Bal Balaram said. But, but the sages, you know, kind of elevated him. So this is a sages talking to Balaram. You have unknowingly killed the Brahmana. Of course, even the injunctions of the revealed scriptures cannot dictate to you, the Lord of all mystic power. But if by your free will you nonetheless carry out the prescribed purification for this slain of a Brahmana, O purifier of the, the whole world, people in general will greatly benefit by your example. So this is what Balaram said. I will certainly perform the atonement for this killing since I wish to show compassion to the people in general. Please, therefore, prescribe for me whatever ritual is to be done first. So he told them, just say the word. And by my mystic power, I'll restore this person. Give him a long life, strength, and sensory power. But the sages said, please see to it, O Rama, that your power and that of your kusha weapon, as well as our promise and Ramaharshana's death, will remain intact. So this is what Balaram said. The Vedas, the Vedas instruct us that one's own self takes birth again as one's son. Thus let Ramaharshana's son become the speaker of the Puranas and let him be endowed with long life, strong senses, and stamina. So this is Balaram. Please tell me your desire, O best of sages. I shall certainly fulfill it. And O oh, wise souls, please carefully determine my proper atonement, since I do not know what it might be. So here again, Balaram setting a perfect example for people in general to humbly submit himself before qualified brahmanas. Even the Lord himself humbles himself. So, <clears throat> here's continuing. O oh, descendant of Dashara, Dash, Dasharha, Please kill that sinful demon who pours down pus, blood, feces, urine, wine, and meat upon us. This is the best service you can do for us. So this is what the favor they want. And then they tell him, Therefore, for 12 months, you should circumambulate the land of Bharta in a mood of serious meditation, executing austerities, and bathing at various holy pilgrimage sites. In this way, you will become purified. <laughs> so this is... So uh, anyway, they just wanted him to be an example and that way he would achieve spotless fame by setting a perfect example for people in general. So Prabhupada writes that there, the Brahmanas could understand the purpose of the Lord and thus they suggested that he atone in a manner which would be beneficial to them. So Balaram is actually the source of all incarnations. Actually in the Arilila 5.4, it describes their Sarva Avatar Krishna Swayam Bhagavan Tanhara Dvitaya Deha Sri Balaram. 
the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna is the fountainhead of all incarnations. Lord Balaram is his second body. So his, as we described, he's the first expansion. And from him expands innumerable forms with unlimited potency. And they're called Svamsa, you see. And then other forms, they have limited potencies and they're called Vibhinamsas. That's like the living entities like us. So, for the purpose of creation, Krishna creates Balaram. And as we know, from Balaram comes Sankrashan, Aniruddha, Pradyumna, Vasudev, the Chaturvyuha, the expansions of Narayan, the Lord of Vaikuntha, and then the second Pradyumna, Aniruddha, Vasudev, Sankrashan. And then we know Adi Shankar comes from there, Lord Shiva. So we understand that Lord Shiva is Vaishnava. Nambayata Sambhu, he's the greatest supreme most of all Vaishnavas. So because why? He's an expansion of the original spiritual master, which is Lord Balaram. See? So <clears throat> this is what happens here. So Krishna and Balaram we see here. Here's Balaram massaging Krishna's feet. And Balaram actually considers himself a servant, but he knows Krishna is his master. Thus, he regards himself as a fragment of his plenary portion. So, this we see Balaram, he desires to serve Krishna. He thinks he's insignificant in comparison. Even though, as we're discussing, he's his first expansion and he has all the same potencies as Krishna. But still, he's just so humble, he sees himself as just a fragment of Krishna. So this is his humility. And in the mood of service, you see, and this mood of humility, they go together. We consider ourselves small, and then we want to serve the great. So this, we, sh we should learn from Balaram how we should feel ourselves very humble and insignificant and develop the mood and the desire to serve the great. So Balaram set an example. You see, Balaram wasn't afraid to express his devotion to Krishna you know, and to proclaim the glories of Krishna, just like we read the past time when he destroyed the city of Hastinapur. He wasn't afraid to tell them what Krishna wants, to sit, you know, to, to come and to glorify Krishna. He wasn't afraid. So this is the mood of Balaram. Even though he's very humble, he's very powerful. Did you know that Balaram is very unique? That there's no uni unique personality like him? Because... He's actually one that takes part in all the five rasas intimately with Krishna. So as Shantaras, we know, Krishna expands himself through his energy, creates Goloka Vrindavan, the spiritual world. You know, that's the energy of Balaram. The land, all the surroundings, you know, expands himself as the, Krishna's crown, Krishna's flute, his slippers, Krishna's clothes, all of his ornaments, and these, he just, so many wonderful forms just to serve Krishna, just to assist him and attract all the hearts of the living beings to his very beautiful decorated form. So, this is what he wants to do. <clears throat> so, as far as Dasharas, this is what Balaram does in the, as a menial servant. But as Sakyaras, he appears as Krishna's friend. They wrestle together, they play together, they dance together, they herd cows together, they even argue, they fight. It's all in the mood of just giving pleasure to Krishna, just to supply service to Krishna. And because he's the elder brother of Krishna, that's the Vatsali Ras relationship. Because the elder brother sometimes, you know, he takes the position, you know, Krishna, you're going to be late. It's time to go home, time to get up. Krishna, it's your birthday. <laughs> You, sh you can't go out and play today. You must stay home. You see. And sometimes they'd be in danger just like a parent protects Krishna. So in this way, this is what Balaram did. But what about Madhurya Ras, conjugal love? Balaram, he can't directly take part in that Leela with Krishna because it's embarrassing when Krishna's dancing with the gopis for his elder brother to be there. You see. 
So Balaram doesn't want to create an uncomfortable situation. So he expands himself as Ananga Manjari. Do you know who she is? She, yeah, she's Radharani's sister. So she's always making arrangements for Radharani to meet Krishna, you know, secret rendezvous between Radha and Krishna so they could take place, you see. So this is why Balaram, he comes in that form so that he can actually assist uh, Radharani's younger sister. And as he serves her so nicely, he makes arrangements for her to meet Krishna. So this is Balaram, he does, he actually serves Krishna in five, in those, all five primary rasas. And then sometimes we see here, Krishna is massaging Balaram's feet. You see? And there's a verse that explains that, you know? So Krishna is massaging the lotus feet of Lord Balaram and he explains how Lord Balaram considers Lord Krishna his master. We can have similar sentiments to this, you know, as they're giving us an example in our association with each other. We're all brothers and sisters, you know, spiritual brothers and sisters, and we should each have the mood of service to each other. And that's why Srila Prabhupada said we should address each other as Prabhu. Prabhu means master. We're the servants and our prabhus are our masters, though they are our servants. So this is like Krishna Balaram. Krishna was seeing Balaram as his master, but he was serving his master. And Balaram was seeing Krishna as his master, but they were serving each other like that. So each in the mood of giving pleasure to each other. And this is a very sweet relationship, sublime. So we should have that mood of service also. So we should say that, you know, this other is my prabhu. I want to serve my prabhu. Thus it make a wonderful, sweet, like pure atmosphere which attracts people. They could pick up on that vibration. And, you know, then they want to actually bring people too. So this is set in that atmosphere. So we see how Krishna and Balaram would walk through the streets and, you know, attract all the conditioned souls. How is this happening today? We just experienced it. The Ratyatra, Krishna Balaram is strolling through the streets, rolling through the streets, you know, attracting all the conditioned souls to see what's happening. Many people we saw, we met at the, there was a, two young girls there from Sweden. It was their first time here. Actually, no, from France. <clears throat> and they said, what is going on? What is going on? And I was just explaining to them. And they're so, it's, people are so fortunate for the first time ever they see these beautiful forms of Krishna and Balaram and their sister, Yasoda. This, just see, beautiful cards here's Subhadra. And we see a festival, a spiritual festival, a cultural presentation of attract all the conditioned souls to Krishna. And here we see them together, Krishna and Balaram and Lady Subhadra at the chariot. Just by seeing these personalities, seeing their beauty, we become attracted and people make advancement. So this is the opportunity that devotees fearlessly go out there and they're not afraid to present Krishna. Even though it's so much struggle, difficulty, they're not afraid like Balaram is not afraid. So we get that strength from Lord Balaram he gives the strength so that we could advance spiritually. Just see how beautiful and powerful he comes to give his darshan. So we're explaining to people, you know, if you find yourself in a pit and you see so many people there, I saw one guy just laying on the sidewalk, just like, you know, you know, like dirty and homeless, shoeless, everything. But yet right next to him is a flower from the garland, one of the garlands, you know. So just see the mercies going everywhere. And we're saying there's only one way. There's no return, no U-turn. It's only one way. And the devotees are out there giving that to everyone. <clears throat> so that's why we have to thoroughly study these descriptions and opulences and expansions of Krishna and his different energies. And then we can understand without a doubt the position of Lord Krishna and we can fix our mind and worship Krishna without deviation. 
sometimes we have to be, we have to get the plow. And this is what the devotees are doing. They're coming out and plowing the way to purify the hearts of the conditioned souls by distributing these books, giving this knowledge so that people have and understand this knowledge of Krishna. You see, so here the pure devotees, they concentrate their minds in Krishna consciousness in full devotion. And therefore, they're always situated in transcendental position. So here, again, devotee acting as a plow, preparing the field so that the seeds will grow. And this is the purpose of the guru, to rip our hearts apart until it becomes very soft, to just plow it and plow it and plow it until all the hardness, the false ego, the pride, the illusion, the lust, anger, greed, and it makes our you know, hearts soft for the seed of love of Krishna to grow in it. So this is what they're doing. They're planting the seeds. So Krishna's flute, we see so many pictures. It's a beautiful painting by Ram Das, one of his last paintings. This is uh, actually the originals at Gira Swami's ashram in his temple room there. <clears throat> So we see Krishna's flute, it's very significant. And why does he carry that flute? Simply to attract and charm the hearts of all living beings to his loving service. And Balaram's plow, what's that plow for? It's the representative, the spiritual master. He softens and prepares the field of our heart for the seed of, to be attracted to the sweet flute of Krishna. And so for clearing the road, the spiritual master clears all these obstacles you know, for our spiritual path so that we can go back home, back to Godhead, and there play with Krishna and Balaram in the spiritual world. Jai. All glory is just Lord Balaram ki jai. Haribo. So any comments or questions? Realizations? If you want to hang around. <laughs> oh, there's no breakfast anyway, right? It's fast day. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Jai Prabhu. Thank you.